This is part two. We don't know how many parts it'll end up being, but today it's part two. We're going to do a preamble, and we're going to follow that up with a review and an overview. And last uh, meeting, we started and finished Colossians 2, 14 through 23, and we're moving toward doing Galatians 4, 1 through 4, 18. So let's start with what we're going to cover in the review. We have to go back to Acts 21 and talk about Paul and James for a few minutes. We need to find out the role of Torah in Romans and 1 John. It's kind of like a foundation. I want to. These are not verses you haven't read before, but I'm collecting them together so that I have a solid base for some of the people who will be uh, listening to this. Romans 10, 1 through 3, we've already done it. This, like I said, this is just a review. There's one place in Scripture where we are required to obey by flesh, not by spirit. And so I'm going to point that out and explain what's going on there. Galatians 5, we have covered it, but I didn't cover it under that title. Uh, Galatians 5 and the conversion, we've already covered. Colossians 2. And then the last topic we're going to review is the Klingon Empire and Paul. What's wrong with this picture? So this is something that's it's a little bit new, but not completely. All right, so... The overview of Galatians 4, Galatians, the letter to the assembly at Galatia that Paul wrote is an example of a damage control letter. He starts out by defending his mission and character. Uh, he discusses the fact that he was given freedom to preach Yeshua by the pillar apostles in Jerusalem. Then he begins a stinging rebuttal to the God-fearers that were there the synagogue. Then he gives the entire argument in a nutshell. And then, if that's not enough, he gives another argument using jurisprudence. And then finally, he gets to the custodian, and that will bring us to getting ready to understand Galatians 4. That's the overview. And just for your own personal notes, the PDF and PowerPoint presentations available online. You can download it. It'll take you a few seconds. Okay, the preamble first. Once again, this is just to equip us uh, current thinking. Where are we? What are we doing? What are the things we need to keep in mind? That's what this is about. We're going to discuss a couple of items that you're both very familiar with. One is called ellipses. One is called phrasing and punctuation. And I've put that in because if you look at the Greek text of the New Testament, you'll see that the words ran together. All right, the first one we're going to discuss is the ellipses. And here's the definition. The ellipses is the omission of one or more words that are obviously understood by the listeners or the readers. It's really odd that the definition of ellipses would contain an ellipses. First time I found that out, I was like, isn't that odd? But anyway, continuing... An example of an ellipse, ellipse, ellipses is 1 Corinthians 7, 19. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But the keeping of the commandments of God is everything. An example of an ellipses. Phrasing and punctuation. I'm going to ask you all to consider the following. Apply phrasing and punctuation to this six-word phrase. Woman, without, her, man, is, nothing. That is six words. Here's how I addressed it. I surveyed 100 people. 50 were men and 50 were women. The men answered, woman without her man is nothing. The women answered, woman without her man is nothing. So as you can see, phrasing and punctuation are important in the biblical text. Also, what does this word say? God is nowhere. Or God is now here. Depends on where you put the space. Just something to keep in mind. Ellipses, phrasing, and punctuation, context is everything. 
The reason I'm saying that is because you can know with the definitions, you can be prepared with understanding the ellipses, you can have the phrasing and punctuation correct, and if you don't have the context understood, you're going to get it wrong. Example, if we were to do all of those things correctly and have the perfect translation from the original text, would it make a difference? The answer is no, and here's why. I have a, Greek, I have a Spanish phrase here, and when you translate it, it says, What want you on your tombstone? Now, English requires us to put the, the word do in, and we have to reorder want and you based on English grammar. So that's why I have the numbers there. So if we do that, we get what do you want on your tombstone? That is the correct English syntax and the perfect English translation of the original Spanish text that I just showed you. What do you want on your tombstone? All right. Is that good enough? No. And here is why. Because of the ellipses. Let's fill it in. What toppings do you want on your tombstone pizza? What epitaph do you want on your tombstone after you die? It's the exact same phrase in Spanish. So which one is correct? Your next meal or your last meal? It's all about context. It's all about ellipses, and it's all about phrasing and punctuation. We have to be sure that we consider that. I like the, the system of this word is always translated to mean this, therefore every time I read it in the text, this is how I'm going to read it. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way because the context can change it. We saw that when we reviewed the word circumcision in Galatians 5.2. It could talk about cutting the flesh, but it could also be talking about the uh, liturgical ritual of conversion to a proselyte. Same word, figures of speech. These are things that we just have to keep in our present memory as we're looking at one of the most difficult letters to understand in the New Testament. All right, here's our review. We're starting with Paul and James in Acts 21. Verse 21, they've been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses. That's number one. Uh, telling them not to circumcise their children is number two. Live according to our customs is number three. These are some of the rumors that had been, let's say that they had been shared with the leadership of the church in Jerusalem. And in verse 24, James has given Paul a solution, which Paul agrees to, and it says, All may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. So in this section here, Paul knowingly and willingly does the things James recommends so that these accusations about saying the law has been done away with, circumcision is to stop, etc., everyone will know that they are not true. I know we've covered this, so this is not new, but I'm just refreshing your memory on it. Okay, next is the role of Torah in Romans and 1 John. Once again, this is, this is somewhat a foundational I'm just bringing it back to your memory so you can see the pieces fit together. The first place I want to start is I want to ask the question about what is sin. In 1 John 3, 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. And then you can see that I've highlighted the next phrase in yellow, for sin is the transgression of the law. So basically, you could use this as a definition, as an answer to the question, what is sin? Sin is transgression of the law. So, let's talk about what is the Torah. The Torah is many things. I'm going to identify only a couple. In Romans 7, Paul asks a question. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. So here 
we can understand that one of the roles that the Torah plays is to identify what sin is. Once again, nothing new. I am going to use the phrase God's righteous standard for the word law or the word Torah a couple of times in some verses that are going to show up. Okay, Romans 6, one. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, I've expanded that. This is my paraphrase of that same two verses. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to violate God's righteous standard just because we have been delivered from the curse that says if you sin, you must die? Of course not. We died to that type of behavior. How can we knowingly and willingly continue to violate God's righteous standard? Just a different way of looking at those two verses. Continuing in chapter 6 of Romans, later on, verse 12, and you'll notice here that I have two words bracketed, both of them in yellow. I have added them to the NIV verse here uh, because for me it helps me to understand the verse better. So I'll read it with my two uh, additions there. Therefore, do not let the sin nature... Reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. I have to ask this question. Is this a free will decision that we get to make to determine whether or not sin reigns in our mortal body? Otherwise, why would Paul phrase it, do not let? Next verse. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. Trick question. Is this a free will decision? Paul phrases it, Do not offer... Does that sound like it's something that we can do? We could offer. Maybe we don't offer. Maybe we shouldn't offer. Maybe some people were offering. Free will decision. It's a trick question because the answer is not necessarily, and I'm going to tell you why. We're going to call this section, Do You Have Any Rats in Your Cellar? C.S. Lewis Some of you have probably heard of him, probably heard of some of his writings. He has a section on rats in the cellar, which I have found to be an excellent discussion about the true life of a believer. And that's why I have included it here in this section. Here's his quote. We begin to notice, besides our particular sinful acts, our sinfulness begin to be alarmed not only about what we do, but about what we are. Thought that was good. Very clear line of demarcation. What we do, what we are. I might have said what we do and who we are, but this is his quote. This may sound rather difficult, so I will try to make it clear from my own case. When I come to my evening prayers and try to reckon up the sins of the day, Nine times out of ten, the most obvious one is some sin against charity. I have sulked or snapped or sneered or snubbed or stormed. And the excuse that immediately springs to my mind is that the provocation was so sudden and unexpected, I was caught off guard. I had not time to collect myself. Notice I've highlighted that in yellow. C.S. Lewis continues, Now that may be an extenuating circumstance as regards those particular acts. They would obviously be worse if they had been deliberate and premeditated. On the other hand, surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence for what sort of man he is. 
Surely, what pops out before the man has time to put on his skies is the truth. If there are rats in a cellar, you are most likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. But the suddenness does not create the rats. It only prevents them from hiding or from having time to hide. In the same way, the suddenness of the provocation does not make me an ill-tempered man. It only shows what an ill-tempered man I am. The rats are always there in the cellar. But if you go in shouting and noisily, they will have taken cover before you switch on the light, and you won't find them. So the reason I said that was a trick question is because, and I'm not going to go there, but just thinking quickly here, Hebrews 5, the last section, I believe the discussion is to a group of people in which it said, you guys should be teachers, you should be handling meat, but instead I'm still feeding you a bottle. Which implies to me that there is a free will activity that takes place within believers to move forward in the understanding of the word. You understand the word, something happens, you apply the word, good for you. But the character change that's taking place, I call it Torah overlay, but you know, you call it whatever you like to call it. The change of the Torah being written on our heart is the character, and when we don't have time to post-process, but we react to a situation, that's where we are in our transformation into the appearance of Yeshua. And I thought C.S. Lewis did an excellent job of bringing that out in that quote. And that's why I said verse 14 is a trick question by Paul. For the sin nature shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Here is my expanded version. For you should not allow the sin nature to lord it over you. Lord it is from one of the Greek uh, dictionaries that I used. I, I thought that was a good phrase there. For you are not under the curse of the law. And I put brackets there because I'm talking about the curse that you find in Torah, which clearly says that if you violate this, if you violate the law, then death is the punishment. We are not under that curse. We've been freed by his grace. And so that's why I have phrased it that way. Verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. My expanded version, what then? Shall we continue, doesn't that sound like free will? Shall we continue to violate God's righteous standard because we're not under the curse of the law, but freed from it by his grace? God forbid. And verse 16, know ye not, that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. Does that sound like free will? His servants ye are, to whom you obey. Example one, whether of sin unto death. Example two, obedience unto righteousness. It appears to me that even as we have accepted the atonement, we have begun to grow in grace. Second Peter 3.18 says in the Greek, it's a continuous action. Continue your entire life to grow in grace. So we don't have it all, but we got a lot. And yet, throughout chapter 6 of Romans, Paul is asking a bunch of questions, and some of them look like we have free will decisions we need to exercise. And this is another example of one. If we continue to sin, something happens and we face death. But if we are continuing to obey, then we are moving toward the expression of Yeshua, which was God's righteous standard. 
Once again, I'm just telling you the role of Torah in Romans and 1 John so we can get ready for the next section. All right, trick question. All of these passages, this is rhetorical trick question, free will decision. If we have free will decisions on all of these events, then we do need to know and understand what the scriptures are saying without a filter to tell us how to interpret it. Otherwise, there are some serious consequences here. If I'm understanding this section correctly, sin unto death sounds serious to me. All right, now, we all know that we continue to sin. Known fact. First John in the ISR, my little children, I write this to you so that you do not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an intercessor with the Father, Yeshua Messiah, a righteous one. Verse 2. And he himself is an atoning offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for all the world. I've put the Greek word there. You can see that I've highlighted the yellow of the ISR translation where they have atoning offering. And I've put the Greek word there so that I can show you how that word is translated in the Greek Old Testament in a few places. In Leviticus 29, 25 verse 9, it's atonement. And the same in Numbers 5 and 8. And in Ezekiel forty-four twenty-seven which is the millennial temple, it's the sin offering. Something to consider. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. We're going to look at verses 5 through 10 of chapter 1. All, I believe, are from the ISR translation. This is the message which we have heard from him and announced to you, that Elohim is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Interesting choice of words there, not from the ISR, but just from the Greek. Light and darkness was a favorite theme of the Dead Sea Scroll community. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and are not doing the truth. Verse 7, but we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Yeshua Messiah, his son, cleanses us from all sin which is a good thing, cleanses us from our violations of God's righteous standard. Verse 8, if we say that we have not sinned, we are misleading ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Interesting, the word deception. One of the sad things about deception is that a person who is deceived can't know it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be deceived bad situation. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is trustworthy and righteous to forgive us the sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the last verse is repeat of verse 8, in a sense, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So you saw in Romans 6, where it's it's talking about sin unto death. But here it's talking about, we're, it's hoping we don't sin, but we do have an advocate, which is a legal term, with our Heavenly Father, because we have now been, by His grace, freed from the curse of, if you sin, you shall die. So I thought that that was good to connect Romans and First John there, just so that we understand where we are. All right, so let's summarize these passages kind of in a nutshell. We looked at the definition of sin, which is the transgression of the law. Paul, in another place, says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. I called it God's righteous standard. It's just a phrase that I like. We can continue to violate God's righteous standard because we have free will. John said, I'm hoping you don't, but if you do, if it happens that you violate, and we all do violate, 
his righteous standard, we have an advocate. Continuing the summary, we control whether the sin nature reigns in our mortal bodies because we have the free will decision. That is what I got out of the way Paul phrased it. He phrased it as, we get to do something about it. Discusses the fact that we are not under the curse, which we discuss. We've been freed from that curse by his grace, which is the good news, or some of the good news. And finally, to whom our obedience is yielded determines our destiny. Bold statement. I know when I wrote this and then I reviewed it, I said, whoa, that's serious. But that's what I get out of the, out of the passage in Romans 6. Continue violation of Torah leads to death. Obedience to Torah through the Spirit leads to right standing. Not that obeying Torah will, I can take all my obedience before the Father and say, okay, you should justify me. That's not what this is saying. When we come in to the sonship as heirs and joint heirs with Yeshua, the Spirit begins working within us, and the obedience flows out of that law written on the heart. This is, you know, not new. What I was trying to put here, because of the next topic that's coming up, is dealing with when we are obeying in the flesh versus through the Spirit. And the example I can give for that is, I know whether or not I want to commune with the Father. I know, I know my own desires of whether or not I want to study the Torah, or the rest of the Scriptures for that matter. Uh, I watch my reactions as I enter... Uh, interrelate with other people, and I can tell what is happening, and I can look at myself and say, you, you know that was wrong. You know that's wrong, right? The way, you're, the way you just responded was incorrect. And so I can evaluate that. I remember when I was in college, I was an assistant manager at Burger King, and the people who were self-motivated to take care of the things that needed to be taken care of, I loved. And the people that I had to stay on their butt, I loved less. So, the thing that I like so much about what our Heavenly Father has done is by changing our heart to flesh and beginning to write the Torah on it, the, in, the uh, increasing grace, which is Second Peter 3.18, we are coming to a place where our character, as C.S. Lewis was talking about, will always respond correctly because we will have the character. Now, I don't know that we'll achieve that in this life, but that is the goal. Okay, and the last thing in 1 John that we saw was that everybody continues to sin, because it says if we say we do not sin, if it, it says if we, do not vi- if we say we do not violate God's righteous standard, we are liars. But the key for us is, by having accepted his grace, We have an advocate that can go before the Father, and I think that that is a fantastic thing. All right, our next section here is Romans 10. We have these three verses, which I just wanted to just go over so you could understand what is happening. Remember, we're dealing with trying to prepare ourselves to move toward the Galatian letter. Verse 1, this is my paraphrase for these three verses. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Jews who are not believers is that they might acquire right standing by faith through the finished work of Yeshua. I bear record that they have a zeal to be found in right standing before God, but they are not going about it the right way. And the last verse, for they being ignorant of how God imparts the status of right standing, went about setting up their own way and have not submitted themselves unto the way God designed. And this is what I like about being able to accept the work of Yeshua, that atonement, and receive the Spirit and begin the process of being changed. Because that is how He wanted to impart right standing all along. And we have access to that now. 
And those back in the first century who did not understand that missed a tremendous blessing of having their hearts changed. There is a quote here from the Babylonian Talmud that we're going to use again in a few minutes. I just wanted to bring you bring you to an awareness that in the first century and in the second century on the Jewish side of things, they understood that becoming part of Israel, that was how you got into the world to come. That was their understanding. Of course, Paul sorts that out for us, and I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. Paul has a very clear and concise statement about this and why this statement is true, or maybe not. We'll take a look at that when we get there. Okay, obedience by flesh only once. How is obedience supposed to be produced? The whole goal, you see it in Ezekiel, I think it's 37, uh, of course Jeremiah 31, um, I also think that either Isaiah or Ezekiel 19 speak about this. The goal is, I will write my Torah on their hearts, and they will obey, dot, dot, dot. The whole idea is to be changed on the inside with his character. That's how obedience is supposed to be produced, internally. But there's a passage in the New Testament where obedience by flesh is required. It's only one, and we're familiar with it, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention when, within this group of review. That passage is Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council. Looking at verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, I changed ghost to spirit. This is the KJV, but I changed ghost to spirit. I have it in the yellow there. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So I looked up the Greek word there. Necessary meant of necessity, essential requirements, and as we've already discussed, this deals with the new people in Moses as well as this time. But here is a situation where they are being instructed on four sets of things that they need to do. Now, eventually, their character should be changed, and they don't want to do it. And this is not a great example, but I know that I used to love pork and shellfish, and now I look at it, and I'm just, like, appalled. I'm like, ugh. I try not to react bad, but that's what happens. What I'm hoping, and we see this in our Torah portions, especially in Leviticus, there are certain things that really upset our Heavenly Father. And he says it right in the text. And if my character is changed into his, I'm going to get upset at those things one day too. So that's a good test. All right, so now Galatians 5 and the conversion. This goes back to how we opened this presentation, dealing with figures of speech, ellipses, phrasing and punctuation and context. And we have already discussed here that this word here about circumcised might not necessarily be talking about cutting the flesh. Verse 2, KJV, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man and man is highlighted there because the Greek word is anthropos, which means man, men and women, mankind. I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. If we understand circumcision as the cutting of the flesh here, then, as we discussed previously, there are some issues, especially with uh, Acts 16, where Paul has one of the followers later to become a teacher circumcised. And the last verse, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Once again, how did we talk about how obedience is supposed to be cultivated within our lives? 
by faith. The work, the change is internal. Our Heavenly Father said he would write it on our hearts after he gives us a heart of flesh. Everything here is internal. Colossians 2, we just finished in the last section. The verses that we had to address, nailed to the cross, and then 16 and 17, two verses together, let no one judge your observance of the biblical holy days except the body of Christ. The last two verses, the, I mean the last four verses, Paul is addressing some of the things that these people were teaching, but what is important to us is that he called them commandments and doctrines of men, which obviously eliminates them from the category of being commandments of God. So we don't have to deal with those aspects. Now, the last category of this review is a unique category, the Klingon Empire and Paul. What's wrong with this picture? Some of you may not be familiar with the Klingon Empire, but I will help you with that momentarily. $25. This is the $25 scholar word of the day. Of course, you don't have to give me $25 today because it's the Sabbath and we don't transact commerce, but any other day, this would cost you $25. The word that we're going to look at is anachronistically, or anachronism. Say that three times fast. Okay, we're going to break this word down into two parts, ana and chronos. The first is ana, from the Greek word ana, which I have in yellow, which means up, against, back, or re-something. Kronos is the second word, which is pretty much the key word of this whole phrase. Kronos has different meanings, so we're going to look at those meanings. The first meaning, Kronos is the Klingon homeworld, for those of you who are familiar with the Klingon Empire. Okay, Probably not going to be important to our study today. Meaning number two, Kronos are master watchmakers, a family in Germany. All right, make fine watches. Definition number three, in Greek mythology, it is said to be the personification of time. What does anachronistically mean? The representation of someone as existing or something as happening in other than chronological, proper, or historical order. I know that's kind of sterile, but I'm going to give you two examples, and then you'll understand what I'm saying. Another definition is one that is out of its proper or chronological order, especially a person or practice that belongs to an earlier or later time. I added or later because that did not appear in the definition, but you're going to see an example of that. So let me give you uh, my examples. First example is the word gay as established in the 1890s in the United States, and you've probably heard the phrase, the gay 90s. It meant carefree, happy, or bright and showy. To claim in 2011 that it meant that all those people were really homosexuals, because that's one of the definitions in the 21st century, would to be to create an era which is an anachronism. Because you're taking this and applying it over here improperly. Example two, the film Titanic 1997 version contains a well-known anachronism. Jack, one of the main characters of the movie, claims to have gone ice fishing on Lake Wasota near Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Lake Wasota is a man-made reservoir which wasn't created until 1917 five years after the Titanic sank. So, first of all, you realize that's impossible. He couldn't have ice fished there, all right? But the idea here is to understand that the writers put in an anachronistic era. Did they do it on purpose? I don't know. But this is a well-known example of taking something and moving it incorrectly on the chronological timeline and saying that it's a reality when it's not. That's what anachronistic. 
All right, so I'm going to give you some reasonable principles. Ask the right question, get the right answer. Ask the wrong question, get the wrong answer. In the 16th century, there were some Catholics who had some problems with the Roman Catholic Church. They protested some of the ecclesiastical laws, the ecclesiastical authority of the church, some of the teachings. They protested. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to see the church become reformed. So I have put PR for protesters who wanted to reform. And of course, if you change that word out, you expand those two words, you get Protestant Reformation. Those were the people who were the protesting reformers. So this is a perspective. Having to observe the sacraments and attending Mass is requiring obedience to the law to be a part of the redeemed community. This was one of the current teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. If you did this, then you were in. Two, they did a surface reading of Paul, and if you've ever read some of Luther's works, you will see this. His statements include, he indicates, a, he denigrates the law of Moses. Denigrate in this phrase means that he speaks against it incorrectly, belittles it, tries to downplay its significance, just is, treats it badly. So a surface reading indicates he denigrates the law of Moses all the way to equating it with Weak and beggarly elements. Where is that? That's Galatians 4. A loss of Christ. That's Galatians 5. A curse. That's a Galatians 3. And falling from grace. That's Galatians 5. Protestant Reformation perspective. Continuing. Since we do not agree with the Roman Catholic Church's position that their law is required for the redeemed, they had to answer this question. Is any law, including the Pauline denigrated law of Moses, binding on believers today? They had to answer that question. So here's how they phrased it. Is the law of Moses still the standard for living for the redeemed community? I think we know what their answer was. Now, if we take that question and lay it over the New Testament, we may be creating something that is anachronistic if that question was not the question that was asked in the first century. Let's check it out. Prior to Yeshua's death, so think timeline, think chronological timeline, prior to Yeshua's death, according to Scripture and according to history, was there ever a question of is God's law the standard for living for the redeemed community? Nope. Now, let's move into the testimony of Yeshua's life. Notice his discussions were about how to keep the law correctly, not about whether it should be kept or not. Now, I know that some can read and interpret certain things to say that he constantly said, he changed the law, he did away with the law, That not the case. We know because we have already reviewed some of those, and we will continue to review others to bring out more clarity about those. But generally speaking, his discussions were about how to keep it correctly, especially, look at, Ma at Matthew 5, probably starting around 21. You have heard, but I say. What does he say that, like a half a dozen times? Now, let's go to after the resurrection of Yeshua. He said, go and make disciples, which you have to go and find out what the word disciple meant in the first century. We'll skip over that for now. We've already covered it. He said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Notice what he did not say. He did not say, teach them that God's righteous standard has come to an end. An in-depth reading of the New Testament in the history of the 1st and 2nd century demonstrates they understood that the law of Moses was still the standard of living for the redeemed community since they refused to change from it, and we will have more on that in the days to come, like the next meeting. Therefore, 
I want to ask you about the real question in New Testament times. And I'm going to give you a hint. You've already seen this. The Babylonian Talmud states that all Israel has a part in the world to come. I believe the question that was asked in the, new, in the first century in the New Testament was, not has God's righteous standard been done away with, but who is Israel? And I want to give you Paul's concise, on-point answer to this. It's found in Romans 7. I'm sorry, 9. Paul says, For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So that tells us that something has happened. There is a change. An aspect of Israel, known as the remnant, well, they will have a part in the world to come. But not all who are Israel are Israel. And so the question is, we need to find out, now that Yeshua has fulfilled that which he has fulfilled, who is Israel? And how do we become a part of it? So this is just a repeat, pressing the question of how to become a part of Israel. Instead of looking at Paul's writings, and especially Galatians, since that's where we're going, and saying, well, this is all about God's righteous standard has been done away with. The law is not the standard for the redeemed community anymore. Instead of overlaying that from 16th century Protestant Christian, Protestant Reformation versus Catholicism, their little bout, let's reevaluate what is happening in the New Testament from the standpoint of Paul's statement in Romans, not all of Israel are Israel. So now we need to find out, Yeshua said it in Matthew 16, I will create an ecclesia, governmental term. Ephesians 2, Paul says that the Gentiles coming in by faith are now part of the commonwealth of Israel. So we need to find out how to be a part of Israel, because not everybody who was is. If we can keep that question in our mind as we move into Galatians chapter 4, that will help us understand the overall picture of what we're trying to establish. So that is my review of passages that are outside of Galatians. The next time we take this topic up, we will be reviewing the letter of Galatians, chapters 1, 2, and 3, so we can get ready to understand chapter 4. All right? That is all I have today. Thank you.